to begin a, a book review that recently appeared in the New York Times. A, a contributing editor of Rolling Stone, Matt Taibbi, wrote this. America never got over the 60s, and here I would add the 70s as well. The deep social divisions that emerged during that decade remain, for the most part, the divisions that define modern American politics. The battle lines are still so painfully visible that 50 years after the beginning of the Vietnam War and the free speech movement at the University of California, Berkeley, the presidential race this year will come down to a contest between a former community organizer, pilloried for supposed ties to 60s radicals, and a former Stanford student who protested against campus anti-war demonstrations. Moreover, the current culture war being played out between watchers of Fox News and readers of the Huffington Post is really the same old 60s argument, pitting social conservatives' unshakable faith in American exceptionalism against the progressive insistence that there's something dark and violent at the core of American primacy. My name is Chris Glosser. I graduated with the class of 77, and I'm particularly grateful for cluster reunions because I was supposed to graduate with the class of 76, but I did a campus ministry internship for a year. So um, I'm glad to be with uh, students from multiple classes. Um, and we've been uh, working with a volunteer task group to kind of shape this, uh, our particular reunion. And we're very grateful for the work of Gail Briggs, Kira Wishart, and Tim Kennedy in there uh, giving us a lot of uh, uh, opportunity to shape and mold this event. We started talking about how political many of us were, and we decided we wanted to do a panel on religion uh, in the public square, and that's how this came to be. And I'm pleased to say that everyone we invited to participate said yes. Uh, and I'm glad to know too, or to, to I'm glad to have you know that uh, they also are, I consider them all friends. And so it's a, been a great group to pull together for this event. I'll be introducing each of them as they speak, and we're gonna start with Dwight at the end and just work our way back uh, to this end. Uh, but I'll introduce them just before they speak. Each will have seven minutes, and I will be giving them a one-minute warning. Um, and, uh, uh, and then uh, we hope to have some crosstalk and some opportunity for questions from all of you. Uh, well, not from all of you, but some of you. And we have a microphone that you need to speak into because we are webcasting this event. And so, um, and hopefully it will be available after this time as well, but it's available right now on the web. Chris, tell people they can sit up in the reserve. There are more chairs up front here. Um, the reserve seats were for our class, but they're already seated, so please uh, don't uh, pay any attention to the reserved uh, signs. <laughs> our idea was to, then came to be that we would open it to everyone uh, who wanted to come, and that's why we moved it here to Niebuhr Hall, which is particularly fitting because this is the hall name for H. Richard Niebuhr, who was a YDS theologian for 30 years or so, and in his book, The Kingdom of God in America, he wrote, there is in religion, or in Christianity at least, a revolutionary and creative strain which does not allow itself to be reduced to a pattern of social conservation and defense. We may call the strain the prophetic one. And in the words of a professor that many of us uh, took to heart, uh, liberation theologian Letty Russell in her book, human liberation in a feminist perspective, we join in God's work of liberation by reflecting on the meaning of that liberation in the lives of those who find themselves dehumanized. Now what's interesting is that this is what many people today are calling queering theology, uh, viewing it from the perspective of the marginalized, the outsider, and the outcast. As many of you know, um, and I don't know, if, did I say my name? Chris Glosser. I was a gay activist when I was here on the campus uh, in the late 70s. Uh, my final year, I served on a Presbyterian task force on homosexuality in the church as the token gay <laughs> member of that task force, which recommended in favor of ordination of LGBT people at that time in 78. 
a recommendation that, needless, uh, you, you probably already know, was rejected by the Presbyterian Church. I uh, served for 10 years as director of the Lazarus Project, which was a first of its kind ministry of reconciliation between the church and the LGBT community, uh, hosted by West Hollywood Presbyterian Church in, in Los Angeles. And um, having served that for 10 years, I started writing and speaking. I've written 12 books, eight of which, uh, well, I've published 12 books. I've written other books, but they're not all published. Um, but I, eight of those have to do with uh, encouraging LGBT Christians to claim and the broader church to affirm our membership, ministries, and marriages, as well as equal rights in the public square. The Presbyterian Church has finally come around, uh, but a little too late to me as, uh, for me as I approach retirement. While remaining uh, Presbyterian, I was ordained by MCC in 2005 and have served uh, three congregations uh, as an interim pastor since then. Now, during my years of writing and speaking, I uh, had to piece jobs together to stay afloat. Um, and one of the jobs I took was as a news reporter and then news editor of a uh, LGBT news magazine. And I remember when I first started working there, I thought, oh, I was giving up the spiritual enterprise and uh, had some nostalgia about that because spirituality is my greater love. And, um, uh, but I came to realize that in fact we were reporting on spiritual struggles, that uh, the very people that were fighting the rights of LGBT people were people who claimed to hold religious values and, um, and so uh, were fighting us uh, and that what we were reporting in our newspaper were in fact those spiritual struggles of our society. These days, my uh, congregation are the people who read my blog, uh, and uh, uh, it's, you can find it by Googling my name. Um, it's a weekly blog for progressive Christians uh, to really um, um, focus on the spirituality of what we do. It's called Progressive Christian Reflections, and it's a, a way of encouraging us to claim our spirituality just as I tried to encourage the LGBT community to reclaim its spirituality. I, I think we need spiritual resources in our struggles with the powers that be, and undoubtedly Henry Nouwen, a professor to many of us, uh, influenced that choice of uh, spirituality as the larger issue on which, by, through which we uh, live out our lives. In the concluding chapter of Ken Leach's uh, book, Soul Friend, a 1977 book, which I've been revisiting um, and, uh, in recent <coughs> months, he writes, the contemplative is more of a threat to injustice than the social activist who merely sees the piecemeal need. The contemplative has the vision that is really revolutionary. And seated at this table are a bunch of uh, contemplatives. They may not think of themselves that way, but I view themselves that way because there's a deep inner resource that has fueled their engagement in the public square. And I'm pleased and proud to introduce the panel. We're gonna start with Reverend Dr. Dwight Andrews, MDiv 77. He's pastor of First Congregational Church, UCC in Atlanta. The history and identity of this African-American church is rooted in social justice and racial reconciliation. The meanings of both have undergone dramatic reinterpretation in the past 50 years. Reverend Andrews and his congregation seek to discern what 21st century Christian witness means and why it should matter. And um, Dwight and I have to <laughs> come a long way to see one another because we're both living in Atlanta. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and something uh, else about Dwight that you may not know, I mean, I was looking at the High Museum of Art uh, 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 webpage and discovered that he was doing a solo concert uh, in accompanying one of the, uh, one of the gallery showings there. And so uh, he's, he's well known in the Atlanta community and to all of you, because I think one of the last times I was here was he conducted a jazz vespers for us all. So Dwight. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, good morning, everyone. I welcome this opportunity to uh, share seven minutes of reflection with you on this issue of religion in the public square. 
Um, I've thought in many different ways how I might begin this very short introduction to what I hope will be a kind of real shared dialogue and conversation with all of you. But in 1960 or 61, Leroy Jones, the great poet and provocateur, wrote a very important book called Blues People. And it was really a critique not only of music, African-American music, but it was also a critique of America, America's social systems. It was a critique in some ways of capitalism. And what he said in that book, which was really profound, and I still use it to this day, is that if you want to understand something about African-American people and culture, you can look at the music and see the evolution of the people and their circumstance. What his critique did is it literally looked from slavery to the 1960s, and it suggested that from the blues and the spirituals that emerged out of the slave context to the early jazz of classic blues and uh, Duke Ellington and others, to the swing music of the 30s, and ultimately to rock and roll and to jazz in the 40s and 50s, you can literally mark the evolution of the changing African American experience. He goes on to call it the changing same because he suggested that two of the things that remain static throughout this evolution is racism, the way in which African Americans are in a sense uh, categorized in the most profound way uh, by their blackness or their otherness. And it was also a critique of the way in which African American culture has always existed in a very peculiar way on this uh, a plateau of capitalism. That is, this has always been African Americans who made and created commodities that were ultimately for sale. And so he begins to critique the ways in which this impacts our interpretation of the culture and the rest. When I talk about religion in the public square for me, I find that the church is really in crisis. And by that, I mean that some of the very specific needs of the 1960s, issues of desegregation, public education, and the rest, seemed to be clear to many of us that this needed to be a part of our social witness, our social gospel, uh, our social justice. However, in the last, I'd say, 40 years, uh, we've, we've seen a much more complicated uh, world emerge in which I think the church has not been as responsive to the subtle ways in which the world has responded to social justice and witness. That is, what I find really interesting is that it's very obvious if someone says white, whites only or blacks only, and so we can kind of see that as something that must be abolished. But the ways in which racism and economic injustice continues today is much more complicated and much more subtle. And in some ways, the church has become much less sophisticated at being in the public square and advocating for positive social change. In a sense, the church, I think, has, has lost this, this battle. And we find that the world has been very, very creative at reframing, if you will, issues of the, the debates, um, the idea that affirmative action is no longer longer necessary because we have Barack Obama or we have uh, Oprah Winfrey. Uh, the idea that we need charter schools as a way to rescue black children uh, out of public school really changes and reframes the debate and has us talking about things that ultimately does not transform the community. And the church has not been responsible, I think, at least the black church in many of our communities has not been as responsive as it was uh, a century and a half ago when the church was the public square. It was in the church basement that we talked about. How do we fight, these, how do we fight segregation? How do we get economic justice? What are our levers? And why do we do it? Because Jesus tells us that we must love one another and treat the least of these. Well, we're the least of these. But now that debate has been reframed. And so in my very middle class, upwardly mobile black church in the heart of downtown Atlanta, it's very hard to have this conversation because we no longer have the kind of critical discourse within our faith community about how we move forward. And in fact, uh, uh, many of our middle class affluent uh, minorities have been co-opted out of this conversation completely and do not see that as their fight. And so for me, one of my major concerns is how do we continue to remind people of our collective purpose as witnesses, as the body of Christ? I think we are losing that battle. I find that uh, the politics of the present day, the cultural wars, if you will, uh, in a sense is a battle that we've lost. Uh, we do now have uh, uh, presidential debates that are so thin in terms of depth and real substantive conversation on either side. And we've now framed the debates as either or, right or left. And that always flattens, in a sense, our, 
our understanding of the possibilities uh, and the potentialities of who we are as a community. And because of that, notice it's right on the edge of capitalism. What happens when people think it's normative for blacks to perform hip hop music? And if you do something different, that's not normative for African Americans. What does that mean? What happens when you have children, even at the university level, saying, well, he talks black or she talks white? This is absurd, and we have not offered the kind of critique that allows us to take the next step. Frankly, if there is a failure of the 1960s from my perspective, it's because we were so close on the vision of what we wanted to do, where black and white children could be together, et cetera, et cetera, that we didn't see to the next hurdle, to the next challenge. And consequently, we have been co-opted out of that next chapter, and the next chapter really no longer uh, exists as a part of our experience and expression. I think that there is a real challenge, not only for the church. One minute. But for the churches, but also for our seminaries and all of our public forums to really carefully go back to our sense of collective purpose as religious communities. Because if we don't, I think that we underestimate the power of, of the collusion, for example, of racism and capitalism. What happens when all of these things work together, not for good, but for ill? Um, I think we, uh, if we underestimate the power of the world, we will not do our job as we've been called to do it. Thank you. Chris, could we have the panel stand so we can see them as they speak? Okay. Well, it's going to be hard with the microphones. I guess if you don't mind holding the microphone while you speak. Great. Okay. I think they're held in. I don't think they're liftable. I guess we can't do that. Sorry. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. The next uh, panelist is Chaplain Lee Hargrove, uh, MDiv 76, a United Methodist minister, retired lieutenant colonel, and he served as base chaplain uh, for Kabul Compound, the headquarters for the American command in Afghanistan. He told the YDS notes from the Quad that one of the, his most pleasurable assignments was an official military escort for Senator Hillary Clinton from his home state of New York. Lee writes, while most of us are opposed to war and the conducting of such action by those in the public square, those who have chosen to defend the nation are still in need of a very strong spiritual presence. And the church, though well, through well-educated chaplains, needs to assist in supplying that need. And I'm glad Lee has uh, assisted in supplying that need, but particularly because I have a nephew serving in the army in Kabul. Lee. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'll do my seven minutes stand up. Um, one thing, ob observation. Many of you are clergy, and I know, always complain why no one sits up front in church. Well, you've all set a very poor example this morning uh, by sitting in the back, and some of you are going to stand rather than come up here. Uh, anyway, uh, this is a little awkward standing, but I'll do my best. The, uh, my involvement as far as the uh, public square I think at two levels, obviously the chaplaincy, which I'll discuss in a minute, and also I was a local pastor for 30 years in the United Methodist Church, primarily in parishes in the state of New York and one here in Connecticut, and always felt uh, it important to be involved in the community. And that was not always the case for the other clergy in, in the community, um, whether it was you know, a small issue like um, going up against the, uh, the Little League and the Soccer League saying, you know, we wish you didn't play your games on Sunday morning, to which the response was, they can go Saturday night, to which we would say, not every kid in this town is Roman Catholic. Uh, and uh, to you know, greater issues of being involved in, in uh, been involved in local politics, not as a candidate, but as uh, you know, working to support issues and always very active in the school issues. Um, was asked to run for the school board once, but I felt that just might be a problem because I still had a kid in the school. Uh, and, Sometimes, you know, we get the church-state thing thrown at us, and I felt I would do it after they graduated, but of course I moved by that point. Um, but that's always been a very big concern of mine, that we who do serve in the parish um, and uh, we're not called to just stay inside the walls of our church and, uh, or our congregation. And I think that's been a very important part of my ministry uh, over the years in speaking out on, on local issues and working with school officials and town officials to, you know. I was in a school uh, district uh, once for 10 years. Uh, 
located near Stony Brook University uh, on Long Island. Very progressive town, and one would think that this would not be the town that might do this, but they had a standing committee of school administrators and clergy to deal with issues around holidays, actually to also open up that the uh, music and the arts uh, in the high school especially were not just grounded in uh, Christian um, ceremonies, uh, you know, we couldn't call it a Christmas concert anymore, and that's okay, winter concert is fine, but to be uh, as inclusive as possible because the town had a, a large Christian population, obviously, but also a large Jewish population and, and a growing uh, minority population, and more in the Hindu and Buddhist fields due to a large presence of, of Asian Americans in the life of the university. Uh, the Muslim community hadn't quite begun to grow in that particular area when I was there. So that was very important to me, you know, because I think sometimes we, you know, we look at the debate and we look at the national level, but we also need to be concerned about uh, the local level. And recently, semi-retired to Rhode Island and uh, uh, am starting to get involved with the local community there as well. So I think that's an important part that sometimes we overlook because, you know, the old, especially here in New England, the old town council doesn't get a whole lot of press uh, unless they do something extremely controversial. And, uh, you know, these issues, uh, including like the ones uh, Dr. Andrews spoke about, also very, very important, and that the other people on this panel will share as we come from many special uh, avenues. Uh, as far as the chaplaincy goes, um, it was not really too in vogue in the 1970s here to announce you were going into the chaplaincy, uh, which actually in the 1970s I didn't announce because I uh, was thinking about it but hadn't really pursued it. Uh, and it was not until 1982, after graduating um, from here, that I was approached to do that. And I did struggle with it. Uh, I was always um, kind of influenced a little bit because my sister had dated a West Point cadet when I was 12 years old and kind of that whole, you know, kind of impressive age and was actually at West Point when Douglas MacArthur reviewed the troops for the last time. And so that was kind of way in the back of my head, but I didn't really feel West Point was a good place to prepare for the ministry. Um, so um, I can't understand why not. But anyway, actually my class leader when I was in chaplain school was a graduate of the military academy, did his four years, came out, went to seminary, and was going back uh, in the military as a chaplain. So maybe it's good for some. And I didn't have the grades or the athletic ability to get in there anyway. Um, but uh, went to the chaplaincy, thought I'd tried for three years and stayed in for 25. At the age of 54, my unit was called to active duty uh, in the National Guard, New York National Guard. And I trained for six months to go to Iraq, which I did not want to go to, because I was totally opposed to that war. Um, and of course, you don't say that when you're in the Army. They don't really approve of that too much. Um, but I did feel that some of the things we were doing in Afghanistan in response to 9-11 and Al-Qaeda, et cetera, and the horrible things the Taliban was doing maybe somewhat justified our existence there. And my prayers were answered. Some might consider that not having your prayers answered, but I did go to Afghanistan and Kabul for six months. Um, while there, I was the military escort for two hours for Hillary Clinton. We discussed two things. She's a Methodist, and so am I. Um, and uh, she was here at Yale Law when I was here at YDS. So her and uh, Bill, that's his name, uh, <laughs> we're here at the same time. How quick we forget. Anyway, no, I'm only kidding. Um, and uh, the irony of that day was there were five U.S. senators there. One of them was also John McCain. Um, and it was right after they left, it was announced that there was a conversation for those who wanted to attend in the dining hall with a visiting news broadcaster by the name of Rush Limbaugh. Uh, so Rush Limbaugh and Hillary Clinton were in our compound in the same day. Couldn't get too much more contrasting than that. Um, and then later on, Condoleezza Rice came, and brilliant woman, and talked to us. Um, two totally different parties, but two very dynamic, uh, well-educated and astute uh, women, uh, one also being a minority. So that was a great experience. I had to go to Afghanistan to meet these people. Couldn't do it in Washington, D.C. Um, but it was a good experience, and I think Hopefully, one, one minute. there's been some change in thinking that the military chaplaincy is a viable and extremely important ministry that should also be shared at YDS. Because um, when someone is under that kind of stress, their spiritual needs, let me tell you, the six months I spent in Kabul were the strongest spiritual experience of my life. And the chapel was going every day. I had four services every Sunday, was also chaplain to the United States Embassy and sometimes had five services. That's not to brag, that's just to say that 
you know, we were meeting a strong need there. Uh, I'm going to embarrass him, but David Stinson, class of 75, is here. David just retired as the senior chaplain of all Navy Reserve chaplains as an admiral. Um, I didn't get that far. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're proud of what we do, not necessarily because we, you know, wave the flag, but because these people need spiritual guidance as well. One other thing I want to add is totally irrelevant, but I happen to be kind of proud of it. I'm a recovering alcoholic. I don't say that to brag. I say it because it's been a great challenge in my life. And today I have 29 years of sobriety, and I can't think of a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Paige Lindsay Smith, MDiv 76, worked at the FAX Abortion Clinic, that's F-A-C-T-S, Abortion Clinic at Yale New Haven as a work-study student her first year at YDS, 1973, and then with Planned Parenthood. Working at women's reproductive health clinics in Birmingham, Alabama, she met her second husband, Dr. Patrick H. Smith, who in 1998 was the declared target of Eric Rudolph, the bomber of the New Woman All Women Healthcare Clinic. She is the grandmother of a choice child, born when her 20-year-old son and his partner chose not to terminate an unplanned pregnancy. That's why we call it choice, she says. Um, and I remember many fond things about, about Paige, but uh, her uh, first partner, Rob, uh, uh, and she were the, uh, with the scandal of Bushnell House, because uh, we thought they got acquainted really, really fast uh, when uh, they began hanging out in each other's rooms, uh, though they had separate rooms, but in fact, they had a pre-existing condition of a relationship. Four years. <laughs> Paige. Okay, um, I'm gonna stand for one minute so you can see me, but I have notes, so I need to sit. But this is me, this is what I look like. Okay. I want <laughs> I want to start with a few lines from a poem by Batsarai Shigama, a Zimbabwe poet, called I Am My Sister's Keeper. And I'm just going to take a few lines from it. Let me rise by bending over to pick another sister, pick up another sister fallen. Let me rise by bending over to pick up another sister fallen without pop, pomp or fanfare purely reaching out to the woman in me. Let me be my sister's keeper because I am. And I'm gonna speak on reproductive rights. I think that is an issue we all thought was done and gone and over. It's not. I've got a little button. I've got two left, pro-faith, pro-family, pro-choice. Anyone wants one? Another bomb in Bombingham. On January 29, 1998, 25 years and seven days after the Roe v. Wade decision and 35 years after a bomb killed four little girls at the Sixth Avenue Baptist Church in Birmingham, a blast exploded across Birmingham's south side, which is also part of the campus of UAB, which is the city university in Birmingham. A homemade bomb had been planted in the front yard of the New Women, New Woman All Women's Clinic, and the explosion instantly dismembered and killed clinic security guard, off-duty policeman Robert Sanderson, and wounded and mutilated our friend and my husband's nurse, nurse Emily Lyons. It was soon discovered that a violent right-wing malcontent who identified himself as part of the Army of God was responsible. Um, when apprehended, Rudolph put out a self-righteous, self-laudatory statement, and these are a couple of his remarks. Uh, the object was to kill the doctor killer. Now, this is my show and tell. Patrick, stand up. This is what a doctor killer looks like, everybody. <laughs> okay. Thank you, dear. Okay. <laughs> okay. And he went on to say, but because the device was prematurely discovered by the security guard, it had to be detonated with only the assistant killers in the area. I had nothing against Lyons and Sanderson. They were targeted for what they did, not who they were. Please note that Eric Rudolph did not have this bomb on a timer. He did not have it on a little movement thing. He actually detonated it by remote control when he saw two people bending over it. So he, of course, was, it was later discovered that he had bought, been the uh, Olympic bomber and had bombed a lesbian nightclub in Atlanta and women's clinics. 
Uh, back in 73, when I got here, uh, Roe v. Wade was about eight months old. The sainted Jill Bigwood, who remembers Jill? Mm. She's just passed away. Mm. Bless her, out in California. She told me, get a work-study job. And the blessed Joan For Forsberg, who many of us mm. remember, yeah, steered me to an opening at the new facts clinic. Marie, were you there? When I yes, we were there together. We <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, I was there a year working for a wonderful woman called Rita Knapp, and I later realized that I was working under some of the most premier OBGYNs in the country who were doing uh, abortion procedures. I went to Planned Parenthood. I worked with Priscilla Allen. Y'all remember Priscilla Allen, Michael Allen's wife? She and mm -hmm. Michael had worked with Clergy Counseling Service for many years, which Howard Moody founded. Uh, it was in Judson Memorial in New York. Um, I thought I was going to do New Testament and apostolic studies after leaving. <laughs> um, I didn't. Um, I ended up at staying in crisis counseling. I worked with uh, at um, addiction facilities. My first husband, Louis Shaw, whom some of y'all remember, and I organized uh, addiction and its effects on the family workshop in. Um, Godforsaken West Alabama a long time ago. I uh, got us thrown out of that church. Um, and on my first day working at the Summit Clinic in Birmingham, I met my present husband, Pat Smith. Those who have never worked in a women's clinic, really, when they, they're surprised to find that there are, there are no classic situations. There are no, there's no predictable kind of patient. There's no typical woman who goes to get an abortion. Um, every woman's reason is different in the end. Every woman feels she's in an insupportable situation. That's why they're there. The decision is always difficult and painful, and every woman comes to that in her own way. Um, God, in his infinite wisdom, gave the custodianship of conception, reproduction, and pregnancy to women. Why, I don't know. Many of us women would like to take that up with him, but there you have it. <laughs> women share in the pro creative process with God, and we've been given responsibility for managing it. It is through women that God decided to bring new life and new people into the world, and he expects women to do so responsibly with the thought of the common good and of our stewardship of our lives in the world. Sex is a gift. Uh, parenthood is a gift. Our bodies are a gift, and we are stewards of that. We need to use it responsibly. Um, I mentioned my grandchild. I think my son and his precious, precious wife were responsible in choosing to have their child. I'm very proud of them. That's why it is choice. They're good parents. Um, people have said to me, but you see how these children, they, they end up being loved. They end up being wanted. No, they're not. I have been, I worked for a long time at a low income One drug minute. addiction facility in Birmingham. And I had clients who had eight, nine, 10 children that were in the foster care system. Um, with one minute, I want to say there was a study recently in St. Louis that gave 9,000 women free birth control at, you know, whatever, they chose the most expensive, most effective methods. The abortion rate in that group of women was astonish an astonishing um, one-third of the national abortion rate. The teen pregnancies there in that group were 6.3 <coughs> births per 1,000 teen women versus the national rate of 34 births per 1,000 teen women. So we need the churches we need to be doing something about this. You are your sister's keeper. Okay, thank you. During his years in Christian ministry, Dr. Kim White, um, uh, MDiv 77, was a low-income community organizer, the issues analyst for the nation's largest funder of community organizing, pastor of two inner city churches, pastor of a suburban church, and the author of five books of sermons and 36 articles on various subjects. Today, he is a teacher, American history, comparative religions, ethics, understanding the Middle East, human geography, etc. 
and a seeker with an eclectic community of religionless spirituality, apologies to Bonhoeffer. He is the father of three biracial black and white children and now the husband of an urban public school teacher. And uh, just a few months ago, he came to visit my partner, Wade and me in Atlanta, and we had a wonderful time uh, going through the, the King Center, which is just minutes away from where we live. Kim. This is what I look like. I did not realize when I was here in the mid-70s I would become an exact replica of Philip Seymour Hoffman. <laughs> I also want to, yeah, it is true. I also want to say that uh, there were great teachers here when I was here. Uh, Rowan Greer, Chuck Powers, uh, James Washington, Leon Watts, and uh, Sister Margaret, the best teacher I ever had. And uh, my, my feelings for her approach veneration. When the Mayflower landed here, half of the members of the, half of the passengers were members of the Scrooby congregation. And half of them were not. They, they called themselves saints and, and uh, strangers. So this whole business of the culture war, are we a, a, a Christian country or are we a, a secular country, the separation of church and state, that issue goes all the way back to that, to that first landing. This is what we do as a, as a nation. The, um, no one knew back in the 60s that the radicals who would grow up to have a big impact in changing the country would come from the right and not from the left. So in a sense, we've always had these, these culture wars. And uh, you know, during, during the Mexican War, there was a whole, the majority of Christians were all about manifest destiny, and there were a few dissenters like Abraham Lincoln who were anti-war. So in, in a sense, when I look back at the past, I say I, it, it's kind of comforting, you know, that, yeah, we're, we're, what we're going through now is not the first time. But in another sense, it feels worse today than perhaps it did back in the, in the past. Um, and I guess religion's greatest plague upon the world has to be the rise of uh, fundamentalism. Yeah. And I don't just mean Christian fundamentalism in America. Uh, the fundamentalist Jewish settlers who are uh, absorbing Palestine and making peace over there impossible, the fundamentalist Muslims, of course, uh, the fundamentalist Hindus who are trying to sterilize Muslims in the northwestern part of, of India, and the fundamentalist capitalists. This whole uh, veneration, this deification of, of the market is a kind of fundamentalism. And you go back and you try to figure out where fundamental, fundamentalism comes from and what, what psychological, uh, social need does it meet. That's a whole other discussion. The, what has managed to change, as Chris mentioned earlier, is the whole conversation has changed. The whole definition of what has to be done has changed. When I was organizing in, in the inner cities in the 70s and 80s, uh, we were going after slumlords and tax codes that benefited slumlords. We were going after banks for redlining, the institutional causes. Yes, people uh, need to make good choices when they live in inner cities like anywhere else, but there were institutional causes that were uh, deepening poverty. That whole discussion is, is you know, pretty much vacant. It's pretty hard even to have an honest discussion about the role of, of uh, this country in, in the uh, divine plan. You know, Abraham Lincoln gave uh, the second inaugural address, he would not be allowed to give that speech today. Just, just the other night, uh, Mr. Romney was talking about Mr. Obama's alleged apology tour. Mr. Obama, you went around uh, saying that Americans had interfered in Middle Eastern countries. We don't do that, we, we, we help people. We can't even have that conversation anymore. What I'm really most interested in, however, is what we do now. And what I want to say about religion and public life is that we need less religion and we need more spirituality. Mm. And that's something that each of us has to be responsible for. God did not make religions. Men, literally men, made, made uh, religions to appropriate some small piece of, of the divine that they were able to ascertain, which is a very small piece. 
And so in a sense, I think, um, I was interested in Chris's comment from uh, quoting uh, Mr. Nowen about the journey from social activist to a, uh, to a um, contemplative. Well, in a sense, that's what my life has been. I'm not, I'm not uh, turning my back on social activism. I'm adding depth to it. Each of us needs to uh, rescue God, as it were, from what organized religions, ours and others, have been, have been doing. God is much too big to be, uh, to be assigned or confined to uh, Catholics or even Christians. Each, each one of us needs to, and this is an old, old cliche, and it's, it's, I hate to say it, but be the change that you want to see in the world. Well, it's taken me like almost 60 years to figure out what that means. You know, the, um, the um, best cliches are the ones that you, it takes you a long time to understand. God is, uh, I personally believe that we need to re reconceive God away from God into a goddess. We, you know, we need to liberate ourselves from this uh, limiting image of God. We need to uh, understand the wisdom of the Buddha. We need to understand the, the spiritual practices of the five pillars. We need to understand uh, how, how Hinduism uh, offers a divine in both aspects, masculine and, and uh, feminism, feminine. And in our communities, we need to conduct ourselves in a way that goes beyond the boundaries of our, of our, of our own faith background. The world is in crisis. The planet is in crisis. One minute. And for us to be settling now for interfaith dinners in our communities is simply not enough. We need to be... Every ethical, religious believer has to have in his or her credo part of the belief that my path is not the only path to God. My nation is not the only nation uh, favored by God. My gender is not the only gender with which to imagine God. If we can become that in ourselves, if we can become a kind of spiritual community within ourselves, then we collect around us that this, this e e eclectic group that I've been talking about. And that's, what we, that's the witness we need to give to the world. It's a, it's a witness, yes, yes we, we stay within our own faith traditions, we, we honor all that, but we live also beyond that. We need, we need a, a spirituality that encompasses the whole world, the flora, the flower, the flora, the, the species, all the species of the world, the ecology of the earth, all of that, because uh, the boxes, the denominational boxes that we are in are simply inadequate to uh, respond to the public crises that we face as a species and as a, as a planet. Thank you, Kim. The Reverend Dr. Robert Brashear, uh, MDiv 75, has been a Presbyterian pastor for 36 years, serving nationally and internationally in urban ministry, social justice, and interfaith relations. Currently pastor of the West Park Presbyterian Church in Manhattan, uh, he helped found Presbyterian Welcome, uh, continuing the legacy of the More Light movement. The West Park was the first More Light church, by the way. Serves as chair of the Interfaith Assembly on Housing and Homelessness has hosted Occupy Wall Street for seven months and founded the center at West Park to pursue his passion for the intersection of beauty and justice, ethics and aesthetics. His blog can be found at http colon forward slash forward slash west hyphen park press, P R E S S dot blogspot dot com. And I want to say that Bob has been an incredible friend to me in the Presbyterian Church. I am so grateful for his witness and the witness of West Park Church. And um, I notice in the Times, in New York Times, that you have now become, the church has become a location for a theater group. And they put on a play there, and, uh, which got some good responses. Welcome, Bob. Thanks. I'll see uh, how far I can get from my iPad to be able to talk. And the other thing is I feel uh, very privileged to be part of this uh, panel, even though I'm slightly outside the boundaries. But then I realize I spend most of my life slightly outside of the boundaries, so it's, that's okay. I think in a lot of ways we're at a real moment of uh, kairos in a lot of different respects. I think across the world, 
not only in the United States, there's a very clear sense that the structures of economy that control the world are irreparably broken. They don't work anymore. Or as it's also been said, perhaps the structures of the economy are fixed so that nobody can do anything about them. But there's a sense that that which has been should be no longer. I think this became very clear when the Occupy Wall Street eruption took place. I think what was really important about it that was different from other movements that we've been part of in our life is that most of the movements, most of the social action that we've been involved in has always been specific. End this war, pass this law, protest this action, get this group in. And for the first time, there was this intuitive sense that the whole thing is wrong. The whole thing needs to be replaced, which is why there was no program, and also because it was a spontaneous combustion. It wasn't a planned get-together. But what I really observed, as, uh, as first of all in Zuccotti Park, was that it was equal parts protest and performance art. And living with this community in my church, over 100 people for about 100 days, and a smaller group after that, I observed that there are actually about three different groups in there. There was about a third who were very idealistic young people who, much like apostles and disciples, left everything they had to come be part of something. A third of them I would call lost souls in very many respects. They were LGBTQ youth who had aged out of the foster care system. Uh, an extremely high percentage of the young people at my church had suffered abuse in their homes. There were people with mental illness and there were people with substance abuse issues. My good friend and colleague in Boston who was part of Occupy Boston said that what really brought that down was not the eviction, but was addiction. You know, so what we encountered was, oh, and then the third group, uh, the third group were the hardcore homeless who, as reported in the Daily News, were pushed into Zuccotti Park by the police. So in essence, we had all the issues that society had failed to deal with pushed into one place. And I admired the courage and audacity of the group to say, we can create a community in which all are welcome, all accepted, and every voice counts. Those ideas were familiar to me. They felt like what the <laughs> church is supposed to be all about. Mm. On the other hand, I got very quickly able to enter into dialogue with my friends uh, who, when I learned that Sukkati probably would have imploded even before the eviction. And the other thing that happened as, as I watched meetings take place, as I watched divisions take place, et cetera, I had this conversation with one young friend and said, you know, you guys moved from the garden to the fall pretty quick, and what you're experiencing right now is what we call original sin. So there's, I, I noticed over and over and over again, like when I would listen to the songs and poems that were written, that even though people would describe themselves as being deliberately non-religious, the language that was used was very much our language. The questions that were being raised were profoundly our questions. So I think you have to see what was going on there, not only as a political movement, but as a social movement that has to do with creating a whole new way of being. And I think that's where we are. Now I just want to say briefly on the other side of that, uh, I've also been very involved on the local level with a group called, uh, it's a movement for a sweatshop free um, Upper West Side. And this is an amazing coalition that has been a collection of undocumented immigrants, union workers, uh, religious people, uh, neighborhood people, politicians, and 60 small business people. And it's the idea of trying to create a just community in one neighborhood in a replicable model. And so that's how you see it goes from sort of the macro down to the micro. And what I found extremely exciting about that was it was able to give the opportunity to explain to people that economic justice is not just something that happens in the halls of Congress or in City Hall. It happens in every decision you make about where you decide to eat, where you decide to buy food, where you get uh, any number of services taken place. And because all that coalition was asking for was obey the fair labor laws. Okay. Finally, I think if it's a time of Kairos, it's definitely a time of Kairos for the church. I believe very strongly that the day of the mainline denominations as we have known them is over. It's done, and we're living in the post loop. They're going to kick around for a while longer, doing some damage along the way, maybe a little good, but it's essentially over. And we need to find a new way of being church and a new way of being faithful people. And I think one of the biggest drawbacks of that, and I'm going to say it right now, I believe, is liberal Christianity. And there's a, a strong, strong difference between the liberal church 
and the progressive church. In New York City, my presbytery, the biggest division in presbytery is not between conservatives and liberals. It's between the large, white, rich churches and the small, poor churches of people of color. And those rich churches I just described are churches that stand for all the women's issues and are inclusive and welcoming of gay people. So part of what I'm trying to say is just because you're in favor of gay inclusion or women does not mean that you really understand what liberation and justice is all about. And until the church wrestles seriously with issues of race and class, we're going to continue to be in a situation One minute. where there is dominance. Okay, the last thing that I want to say is this, and that is that as we prepare for this new, new kind of church, the marks of it, I believe, are these. It needs to be global in perspective, recognize interfaith as a way of life. We need to be practitioners of what my friend Seku calls organic theology, that is rooted in community and exegeting the ongoing life and experience of that community discourse of transformation more than liberation, which is holistic, willingness to seriously engage issues of race and class, and finally, to live at the intersection of beauty and justice, ethics and aesthetics, and to create a community of radical hope. Thank you. The Reverend Dr. Marie Fortune, MDiv 76, is the founder and senior analyst at Faith Trust Institute <coughs> located in Seattle. Faith Trust is a national organization addressing the intersection of violence against women and faith communities, which seeks to ensure that faith leaders are part of the solution, not part of the problem. She is an educator, activist, author, ethicist, and theologian, and a celebrity in her own right. <laughs> Um, and I have to make this personal note. Uh, I am indebted to you, Marie, for helping me when I was facing non-ordination in the Presbyterian Church, helping me understand that my pursuit of ordination itself was ministry. So I thank you for that, Marie. Thank you, Chris, and thank you for organizing this. Uh, we all really appreciate it. I'll stand initially, but then I also am gonna sit because I have some notes I wanna follow. The first thing in the spirit of full disclosure is I just want to say that um, all the trouble I've gotten in during my ministry is solely the responsibility of Margaret Farley. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it has been much, so thank you, Margaret, for, for that. Um, Poor Margaret. I just want to begin with a quote from Vice Presidential nominee Paul Ryan. Now it's a war on women. Tomorrow it's going to be a war on left-handed Irishmen or something like that. Now I'll sit down. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about the war on women because it's critical to this discussion and to our life together. The war on women is not new. It has been with us for eons, but now we have a term for it. And if we look at the war on women, we really have to understand that fundamentally it is about religion. And religion is the subtext of many of the issues that women are facing today. Whether it's the attack by the Taliban on a 14-year-old girl named Malala in Pakistan because she was advocating education for girls, and this was a considered an outrage by most Americans, Yet it is, it is the same war on women that is being waged here in the United States. It is a concentrated effort in the area of um, women's reproductive rights by state legislators in the last particularly two years to limit access to safe legal abortion. 135 bills have been introduced at the state level in the last two years to limit safe legal abortion. The tactics such as requiring ultrasounds, including transvaginal ultrasounds in uh, Virginia and several other states, uh, which I assume that you have read about, those of us who deal with sexual assault understand that forcing women to have transvaginal ultrasounds is actually rape. The forced penetration of the vagina 
by a penis or any object against a person's will. In South Dakota, they considered a bill in the state legislature defining, redefining justifiable homicide to allow the killing of abortion providers. Fortunately, this did not pass, but the very fact that they would have this conversation in a state legislature is significant. The one bright spot, I think, in this discussion um, was in Mississippi, where the personhood initiative failed on the ballot. But it would have made abortion illegal even if the health of the mother was at stake. And interestingly, Joe Walsh, who's a representative from Illinois, has proposed removing the exception for women's health because he explained that, that it just doesn't happen anymore that a woman's health might be at stake, a woman's life might be at stake around uh, a pregnancy. So we don't have to worry about that anymore, so we can remove that exemption. This is where we are in this discussion. Now, in the issue of birth control, and, and Paige referenced this in terms of we thought that was settled, and it isn't. Um, HHS policy mandating health plans to provide coverage for contraceptives resulted in pushback on several fronts, not the least of which was the Roman Catholic Church, which uh, pressed for an exception for religious institutions. Now, with all due respect to my Catholic colleagues, uh, I think it's fine for the Catholic Church to preach and teach what you want, but I don't think you should be allowed to dictate public policy. The Blunt Amendment actually was a proposal in the Congress to give employers the right to decide whether women would have access to birth control through their health care plan. Employers. Really? Employers? This was fortunately voted down 51 to 48, but it did pass in Arizona. Now, the concerted effort to eliminate family planning and Planned Parenthood has clearly been supported by the Romney-Ryan ticket, and uh, we also heard it in the primaries uh, loudly from Rick Santorum. This is not a fringe effort. This is central to the political process at this point. And it extends to foreign policy. If uh, Romney is elected, he has said he will reinstitute the global gag rule, um, which came from Reagan and Bush, and basically eliminate support for family planning to any group in terms of foreign policy um, funding that even discusses the option of abortion with women. In 2012, you may recall the image of the House hearing panel of five men who were asked to discuss contraception and why women didn't need it. <laughs> um, and women were not allowed to speak. And, you know, I... <laughs> <laughs> what century <laughs> are we living in at this point? Um, now, where does this intersect with violence against women, which is the uh, primary area that I work on, but it's all related. The U.S. bill, which was introduced for No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion Act, sought to redefine rape so that only forcible rape or child sexual abuse would be an exception to the anti-abortion effort. And then, of course, there's Todd Aiken, who enlightened us with his explanation of how sex works by explaining legitimate rape. The refusal to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act, which we are facing at this point, is unconscionable. Since 1994, it was a bipartisan effort. It's actually working. The figures on domestic violence are going down, and yet they want to cut that program. Much progress has been made in the last 35 years in terms of women's lives and experiences because of the courage of many survivors who have come forward and shared with us their experiences of abuse. Much progress in faith communities has been made. Women's lives are different, and that's why we see the backlash. We have learned that we can take nothing for granted. 
Our work means that we have named the ways in which the teachings and practices of the Christian faith have and continue to be part of the problem of violence against women and children, and we have begun to deconstruct these teachings and practices. But we are also lifting up and affirming the ways that the Christian faith, if it is true to the gospel that Jesus taught, is part of the solution, a bountiful, re bountiful resource not only for healing and restoration of body and soul, but also for justice and prevention. As we consider uh, the, the time ahead of us in terms of our work for social justice, and I think this would be true that we would share this here, the image that stays with me is that of a sailboat, and as a novice sailor, I think I understand how this works, that a sailboat never moves straight ahead, but that it moves this way, and then it moves this way, and then it moves this way, but eventually it gets over there. And I think at this point in time, that's how social change works, that's how we are a part of it, and those of us who've been fortunate enough to sail some of these boats in recent years are preparing to pass the tillers along to the next generation, and we hope you're up to it. Thank you. Dr. Margaret Farley is the Gilbert L. Stark Professor Emerita of Christian Ethics at YDS. She is the author uh, or co-editor of seven books, including Just Love, a Framework for Christian Sexual Ethics. Is that Just Love or Just Sex? Just Love? Just Love. <laughs> you can tell my bias. During her 36 years, during her 36 years of teaching at YDS, she also served for eight years as the co-director of the Yale Interdisciplinary Bioethics Center and as director of the Yale Divinity School Project on Faith, Gender, and Responses uh, to AIDS in Africa. In addition to lecturing and writing, she is currently co-director of the All Africa Conference, Sister to Sister, which facilitates the work of women in faith communities responding, responding to the HIV AIDS pandemic in Sub-Sahara. Um, I want you to be mindful that she is going to appear on 60 Minutes. We're not sure when, but she has been interviewed, so watch for that uh, oh. segment. Um, and also, um, I just want to ask if um, you've sent your thank you note to the Vatican for making Just Love a bestseller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Chris. When Chris Glasser described to me the focus of this panel on religion in the public square, he said that it would be a sharing of our own ministries insofar as they have taken us into the public square, into the marketplace of ideas, politics, public policy, and so forth. Since I tend to think of myself more as an academic than an activist, I was unsure what I could contribute to this discussion. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, right. Vocations, <laughs> vocations, however, often take circuitous routes and unexpected turns. And as I thought about my own experience, I realized that at least to some extent, I have all along tried to do something about key ethical issues in our day as well as think about them. I came to the conclusion that perhaps I am what might be called an accidental activist, <laughs> like the well-known accidental tourist in Ann Tyler's novel by that name. Ethics as a discipline, of course, is quite suited to such a crossing into the public square. If one works, for example, as I have, on urgent questions in medical ethics and bioethics, such as stem cell research or decision, decisions about dying, or the value of reproductive technologies, or distributive justice in healthcare programs, or contested environmental problems, 
It's unlikely that one can simply sit in the proverbial armchair and muse leisurely in response to such questions without recognizing the meaning they have in the lives of concrete persons and groups, present and future. Ideas do not simply swirl around in cyberspace. They have to do with real human and cosmic needs, suffering, a kind of anguish about what, what actions should be taken, or at least recommended. They become the substance of thoughtful debate, or they can, wherein both common and individual goods must be weighed. Anyone who works on these sorts of questions, ideas, human needs, is almost inevitably drawn into the public square, and so I have been. If one works on ethical questions of human construals of gender, of discrimination, of false stereotypes that allow dominant groups to determine the meaning of people's lives and the limits of their possibilities, it's also almost inevitable that the public square opens to demand the testing of new insights on the margins as well as at the center. If one works on ethical questions rising out of the sexual sphere of human life, same-sex relations, divorce and remarriage, and so on, exploring why and how it is that human sexuality can be creative, life-enhancing, and just, but also why and how it is sometimes destructive, shriveling loves and relationships. Here, too, one is drawn into the struggles for clarity in both private and public spheres. The personal becomes political. The political touches the lives of real persons. Moreover, insofar as ethical issues include issues of justice and injustice, fairness, obligation, the common good, protection of the most vulnerable, in multiple sphere, spheres of human life, these questions demand that we not only think about them, but do something about them. They reach all the way to profoundly religious sensibilities, searches, and actions. We all know the difficulties of religions clashing or getting in each other's way as they attempt to bring ministry to the public square. It is here, however, where we can or could learn to respect one another to gain strength in our faith and ethical, and ethical commitments, to politically adjudicate seemingly intractable problems. The call to a mystery, to a ministry of co-learning with those willing to discern shared actions brings us somehow to the public square, whether to act within it or to bear witness to it. I've learned many things as an accidental activist. Let me briefly identify just three of these. First, limitation, the reality of finitude. No one can do everything. One minute. We all can do something in the public square, whether it is the global, national, city, or town square. I, for example, am not a public intellectual like Reinhold Niebuhr. I cannot challenge the whole world on economic inequities like Dorothy Day or Jeffrey Sachs. It is generally not a great plan that activates us religiously and morally, but circumstances that show us the next step in my own experience, it has been important to work, 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 for example, on effective committees, whether in professional civic advocacy or church organizations. 
I have, for many reasons, been moved to work with women in Africa on a project sustained for more than 10 years in which there is mutual capacitation for responding to the AIDS pandemic. And then there are the invitations, 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 requests, requests, and pleas to come to discuss, to share the search for insight on these, pres on these problems that trouble us all so much. I have tried to raise my voice on some urgent issues, despite the sometime cost. There are limitations, but also possibilities. Second, epistemic humility, humility about what we know. In the world of ideas, in the ideas that help or harm the world, no one has the last word. Yet we must search for solutions to the burdens that so many people carry, that we ourselves may place upon them our own ideas, especially if they reach to the public square, must be tested by the wisdom of others and by the practical consequences they effect. Third and last, ultimately the fruits of our labor are in the hands of God. I do not believe that our labors, whether of mind or body, are unimportant to God. God, after all, does not play games with us. We are called to do what we can, not expecting to see the world change drastically because of our ideas or our actions, but trusting that the call we received to help mend the world is no joke to God. There are fruits, good fruits. If we are careful of one another, if we never count only on ourselves, if our concern, our compassion, and even our courage are tested and tempered by the encomium in the public square, see how they respect one another, and in the church, see how they love one another. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Farley. Um, Reverend Janet Edwards Ante has sent her apologies. She cannot be with us because she's integrally involved in the in President Obama's campaign in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So it's natural for her to be there, uh, and it's natural for any of us to be excused for similar uh, uh, good uh, intentions. But I do want to read her description to you. Reverend Janet Edwards, MDiv 76, has been a Presbyterian Church USA minister in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for 35 years. She offers a Christian perspective on LGBT inclusion online at http colon slash slash time to embrace dot com. Uh, participated in the On Faith panel of the Washington Post online for two years and post uh, in the religion section of the Huffington Post. As we prepare to receive any comments or questions that you may have, and Steve is going to uh, hand the microphone to people who raise their, lift their hands, I'd like to see if there are any questions or comments uh, on the panel for one another. I just want to make the observation, isn't it wonderful that Margaret Farley sounds the same as she sounded 35 <laughs> years ago? <laughs> Not that she doesn't have new ideas, but... I was going to say, I hope it's not boring. <laughs> I had wanted to add... I had wanted to add when uh, Marie was talking, and I ran out of time, and I think this is where we, we overlapped, that um, when she's talking about violence against women, that I very strongly feel that forcing women to bear children... to force a woman to follow through an unwelcome, unintended pregnancy, which is almost half of all pregnancies in this country, um, or to not be able to control her own fertility is probably, to me, one of the most obvious, most salient aspects of violence against women. Hmm. So, Marie, thank you for bringing all the, that out. 
I want to add a comment about your, your statement about uh, mainstream denominations are, are done. And I was thinking, wow, I mean, w what's a student here going to think about this? Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you're right. I mean, I think I understand what you're saying. But I want to, I want to propose something for the students here. Um, there will be jobs out there. But the um, question is, what you do with those jobs. And I want to propose a, a, a meaning. This is going to be way out there, and for which I apologize. But this is way, way out there. But to be an ethical pastor today, an ethical religious leader, I think you, the, the method is to start with what would God be like and work backwards, OK? Would God uh, really say, I want this gender to have domination over that gender? No, God, God would not do that. So that needs to be set aside. Would, would God say, I choose you, you as a people, and I want you to go slaughter those people so you can take their land? And, and you go on down the line. Now, that raises a very difficult question, is what do you do with, um, what do you do with, uh, with uh, scripture? And I guess what I'm proposing in the world that we live in, what we need, is scripture being held to ethical, this ethical standard also. So that the ethical, the, the sense of God as universal, as transcendent, uh, beyond any one perspective, religion, et cetera, that's what we hold on to. And everything else gets worked backwards. You get in trouble, um, but that means you're doing something right. Uh, just a very quick response. I think if I would have said it a little bit more explicitly, it would have been that the uh, mainline denominations as we have known them. Uh, and by that I mean in terms of being uh, sort of national staff, structure driven, living out corporate models that are exhausted and no longer, re I think where the action is going to be for you who are students now is at the grassroots level through collaborations, through cooperations, through networks and partnerships of all kinds of folks. I mean, anyone that you're going to encounter out there who wants to join with you in the creation of a more just, humane, and sustainable world, that's where the action's going to be. That happening at the grassroots level. Yeah. There, are, there are no more boxes. You, you, just, you just can't be in a box anymore. Uh, <laughs> um, I think this is one of the reasons why I came to YDS, so that we could have these conversations. Um, and I do agree that the future of the church must look different than the way it appears to us now. I think the, the more important fundamental conversation, though, has to understand the way in which the history of the church, the history of religion, has always been about boxes. And that to understand these structures like religion and church really requires a, a deep self-reflection, if you will. So, for example, the black church if there is such a thing as the black church, and it's not one but many, has always been about a particular box trying to climb out of another box. But church and religion is a very, very densely wrapped thing in which music and culture and identity and values all have very specific expressions. And so how we look to the future of the church is being responsible to these issues of justice and ethics and spirituality, I think requires a, a kind of rigor that we presently do not engage the question uh, with. Uh, but I do think that, for example, uh, the reason why we have different churches and different denominations, the reasons why megachurches are flourishing in some places are very specific and not accidental. And a very careful reflection will give us some answers of where the, the future and the potential of the church is. And I think that's the conversation that I would very much like to hear more about. Uh, the issue of sexuality in some black churches is much more complicated than in other black churches for very specific reasons that have to do with history, culture, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but if we're going to face it honestly, if we're gonna face the issue of violence honestly in its many manifestations, then the church will have to be on the forefront of a public conversation about what violence really means and its many manifestations. What does God really intend around sexuality and how can we move together as the people of God, I think is a, is a, a much more ch challenging conversation than we've presently given credit to. Thanks, Dwight. As we move to the audience, I 
remind you that we have 15 minutes or less. So please uh, make your comments or questions succinct, please. And Steve will be the arbiter of who gets the microphone. Please keep a balance of women and men as much as possible. Does everyone have their wallets out? <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Patrick Ward. I graduated in 08, and I serve a church in Boston. And in Massachusetts, we are confronted with a ballot question. It's known locally as the Death with Dignity initiative. Mm. And um, people are sort of looking at church leaders, and church leaders are hesitant to comment on this, uh, particularly mainline church leaders. So, uh, Professor Farley, I, I'm wondering if you have any guidance for those of us um, who are on the receiving end of some of those inquiries. Uh, death with dignity would allow patients uh, to choose to end their life uh, under doctor supervision. And uh, I'm, I'm, there have been similar initiatives elsewhere in the country. Well, it's astonishing that churches have nothing to say, but um, my impression is today, I mean, we suffer from such... Let me get this closer. Actually, I taught for 30 years, or for, since the renovation in this lecture hall almost every day without a microphone. So I could do it like this, but let me... <laughs> um, <laughs> We suffer generally from a lack of energy in regard to critical issues. The one thing that pervades our culture right now is the fact that unlike the 60s and the 70s, when there was so much energy and along with it so much optimism, we can't count on that anymore. It has disappeared by and large. And yet we have questions I, I don't think the death and dying question was front and center in the 60s or 70s. We have, set, we have questions that are important to all of us. But let me be specific uh, regarding the legislation, uh, proposed legislation in, in the state of Ma Massachusetts. I have to confess I have not yet had time to read uh, that whole piece of legislation, but I've been given to understand that it pretty much looks like uh, the law in Oregon. And my guess is that the churches do not speak about it is because there's an awful lot of ambivalence about the issue. And the fear is, well, if we say yes to this, it'll go to that. And so let's just wait and see what happens or trust to the people or, or uh, study the situation. I mean, the fact is the world has not come to an end in the state of Oregon or the state of Washington. Why is that? Is it because that legislation does not hold the danger that people are afraid of? Or is it that it works so well that no one wants to raise a question about it? That there's just a complex set of questions that seem to me have to start for, for, relig for relig still religious persons in their parishes or wherever they come together as co-believers. Thank you. I'm Talitha Arnold, I'm class of 1980, so I had the good fortune of overlapping with some of these people because it took me four years uh, because, because of an intern year. So thank you very much, it was a great, great panel. Um, I would just like to add to or add something to the conversation, and that is, at least my experience when I was here at YDS, was that the issue of faith in the environment and caring for creation, caring for the environment, was not seen as it was not on anybody's horizon, at least that I saw. Um, having grown up in a family where my father was a biologist, my mother was a botanist, it was very much on my agenda, and I've served in the Southwest for 25 years now where it's very much on the agenda. And I simply would put that out to, to those of us from the late 70s and early 80s that that's an equally critical agenda that has overtone, I mean, that also connects with issues around racial justice, around gender issues. Certainly in the Southwest, access to water is oftentimes determined on, is always determined on issues of class and issues of race, um, not only for Native American communities, but also Hispanic and African American communities throughout the major southwestern cities and also rural areas, uh, but also issues around global warming and all of that, that those are, those are critical issues that, that we face um, that weren't quite on the horizon uh, 30 or 40 years ago. 
very quick response, uh, Talitha. You'll be interested to know that at the Divinity School, two out of the four uh, ethicists on the faculty specialize in environmental ethics, and that uh, an, a large number of uh, doctoral students in ethics have been doing their dissertations on areas of environmental ethics, and there are plans afoot for a joint appointment of a faculty person between the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies on the one hand, and uh, YDS on the other. So it's a movement rising. <laughs> Uh, yes, my name is Alexander Hamilton. I am I am a first um, <laughs> a first year MDiv student, and you something were shot by Aaron Burr. something that um, I am really concerned about now. Uh, full disclosure: I was one of the earliest uh, earlier campaign um, grassroots persons who worked on Obama's campaign the first time he was elected. Um, something that I am just extremely disappointed in now as a Christian that I cannot get my arms around and that the church has been silent on is this president's drone campaign um, where there have been several thousands of people being killed by essentially remote control. Um, they have a um, practice that they call double tap. Uh, and double tap is once you launch a drone campaign and you kill someone, uh, then the drone circles above and waits for people to come and rescue the fallen people, and then the drone attacks again. Um, this is under this president. Um, this president has a kill list where he decides where he is the judge, um, the jury, uh, the, the convictor, and the executioner. And for me, the church has really been silent on this. We haven't really had a lot of pastors speak out about it. Um, and I just wanted to get you guys thought on it as this, this is a religious and um, a town square forum. Thank you. If I may comment as no military expert on that end, but I totally agree with you, regardless of who the president is. Um, I think that war has reached a point of complete absurdity in the fact that even when you're there, whether you want to be there or not, you don't know who the enemy is. I sat in a vehicle uh, on my way to do a service at Kabul Airport, a highly uh, you know, um, safe vehicle. It was a Toyota SUV. And um, a man on the street stuck an AK-47 through the window. There's no uniform. There's no identifying. Fortunately, he did not use it. But I think this kind of war is, is horrible. I don't think uh, we should be using drones. Um, not that we should be using anything, if at all possible, but to just strike when there is absolutely no way to prevent it and no warning, I, I would agree with you uh, on that. And as far as the role of the church goes in any of these issues, my own personal feeling, and it may be heretical uh, coming from a church with a hierarchy, uh, but I'm retired, so what difference does it make? Uh, I'm not looking for an appointment. Uh, is I think we need to move the church from the Pharisaic back to the prophetic. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see that being done in a lot of places. And whether you are a pastor here or you are a member of a church or attend whatever religious community, you know, we need, I think, and YDS has always been a place of that, and I think we, once again, to need to be the voice on these issues, you know, crying in the wilderness. And that may change the mainline churches, but hopefully for the better. I just heard the bells ringing, meaning that those bells toll for us. We must bring this to a close. And I want to do so by reading something that was posted over my workspace for a couple of decades, which is a quote from Richard's brother Reinhold from the History of Christianity. Many of you are familiar with this quote, I'm sure. Nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. Let's thank the panelists. <laughs>